Hello, Manitia, so long as Ah, start vanilla. Mm.
Look at the bus from the ground. On behalf of the Department of Chemistry, our women's college, it's a great pleasure to be Ma, on the mobile, ma. No, no, I'm just sure. One thirty start, but I'm not. Let me see. Eight four.
Masar. Good afternoon to all. Am I audible? Yes, ma. Yes. We'll start the session. Yes. With the blessings of Almighty, we'll start this session. Good afternoon to one and all present here. We gathered here for international workshop. We, the Department of Chemistry, Bharati Women's College, in association with Tamil Nadu State Council of Science and Technology, Department of Science and Technology, Government of India, organizes this one-day international workshop on modern approach to chemistry and followed by hands-on training on solving spectroscopic problems. With this, I would like to call upon our beloved head of the department, Dr. S. Dharani, to give the welcome address. Hello? Hello? Nitya, can you hear me, ma? Can you hear me? Nitya? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Ma Good afternoon to one and all. On behalf of the Department of Chemistry, Bharat Women's College, it's a great pleasure indeed for me to welcome you to the international workshop on modern approach to chemistry and hands-on training on solving the spectroscopic problems in association with Tamil Nadu Science and Technology, Science and Technology Government of India. I'm very I'm very happy and grateful to our three eminent guests who have come from home and abroad to share the knowledge and experience to explore better way of, of educating our future. I welcome Dr. Ars, Secretary. I welcome Paul Williams, University of Lister, Lister Chemical Pedagogy Group, London, UK, and Dr. K. Gita, MGA College, Tamil Nadu. I welcome and thank the beloved principal, Dr. Vlad, for invaluable help and advice. Welcome all faculty staff members from our department and many others who have given their help to this process. I firmly believe that this international workshop will be a big step in future of higher education for the participants, especially for the students community. I welcome once again to this international workshop. Thank you very much.
Shridev, ma'am, you can start. Shridev, ma'am. Ma'am, Sarni. Yeah, you can start. Sarni, ma'am. Yes. Okay. Let me introduce our chief guest, Dr. K. C. Nivasan. Dr. K. C. Nivasan, Member Secretary, Tamil Nadu State Council for Science and Technology, Department of Higher Education, Government of Tamil Nadu. He has completed his PhD degree in Madurai Kamraj University and PhD in Madras University. He has 34 years of wide-ranging experience in the government and the industry. He is a member of American Chemical Society, Fellow of Indian Chemical Society, Life Member in the Madras Science Association, Tamil Nadu Astronomy Association, Museum Association of India, and International Committee on Museum Paris. He has organized many national and international uh, training program uh, with the, funded with the various state and central government. He has published many research and technical papers in the national and international journals. He has developed new drugs, intermediates, chemicals, and bulk drugs to the innovative method. He has received grant from Ministry of Culture, New Delhi, for the modernization of gallery by digitalization and from the Departments of Science and Technology, New Delhi, for the abrogation of the mathematical genius Srinivasa Ramajam Gallery at Senec. He has developed various galleries for Tamil Nadu Science and, Te uh, Science and Technology Center, such as Material Science Gallery, Energy Gallery, Innovative Gallery, Exhibit Gallery, and Children Gallery, Science Park, and Traffic Park. He has involved in commissioning and the implantation of the Anna University Center Planetarium at Trichnapalli and Regional Science Center at Coimbatore. He has visited various laboratories and science centers of foreign countries like Netherlands, Germany, Singapore, and Seoul. He took charge as a member secretary, Tamil Nadu State Council for Science and Technology on September 2017. During the short period, the well-known unique program of students project scheme of Tamil Nadu state increased from 200 project to 500 project for the year 2017 to 18. At present, 700 student projects are supported. The patent information center at the state council is conducting a awareness program for welfare innovators, researchers, students, and entrepreneurial activities are performed. He obtained GI for the Kodekanal Pundu. He has initiated technology demonstration centers and 79 SNT research product in projects in Tamil Nadu. I would like to take this opportunity to express my sincere gratitude to Dr. Srinivasan for honoring a keynote speech for our international workshop. Thank you. Over to Sri Devi. Uh, any problem? Shall I start now? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Welcome, sir. You can start your presentation, sir. Okay, thank you. Distinguished guest of the function and the resource person for this program, Dr. Dylan Powell Williams, Laser Chemical Learning Enhancement and the Pedagogy Group, London, UK, and another guest, Dr. Gida, Associate Professor and the Head the Department of Chemistry. MGA College, Vellore, respected principal, Dr. D. Gladys, Bharati Women's College, Chennai, convener of this workshop, Dr. S. Dharani, Achodi, Department of Chemistry, coordinator, Dr. Sridevi, faculty member of Chemistry Department, learned professors, scientists, academicians, research scholars, and my dear student, good afternoon to all. It gives me an immense pleasure to be here today for the inaugural of workshop on modern approach to chemistry and a hands-on training on solving spectroscopic problem being organized by Department of Chemistry, Bharati Women's College, Chennai. I am also very happy to inform that the Tamil Nadu State Council for Science and Technology is associating with this program through in a small way for the cause of development of scientific temper. This program is supported 
as a part of under seminar and conference sponsored by the by our council under higher education department government of tamil nadu i congratulate the bharathi women's college for organizing this very important and useful program my dear participants i am of the firm opinion that a good ground has been prepared by our generation in respect of science and technology in our country it is you who can make use of it for further development and lead the country through a safe smooth and secure path my special congratulations to each one of you my dear students for the successful journey that you have made to this international event my, my advice to all of you is to proceed with the same tempo and learn more of science and become persons who can create new knowledge the future of india lies on your shoulder in you my dear students our country has set high hopes of development to be able to compete with the developed nations you possess all the courage and the energy to make india a country which is sustainable developed and intellectual which can act a guide for the rest of the nation <laughs> my dear students science and technology helps not only in maintaining food security protecting environment making life healthier generating energy electricity deciding what is good and what is bad but also helps in combating threats from other countries molecular aspects and addressed using tools of bioinformatics and the computational system biology based approaches additional topics include concepts in neuroscience infection and immunity integrative biology biomedicine you should further continue to waste research in science and technology for finding solutions to some of the critical problems affecting the living beings and the environment on this globe technology development and innovation are the most crucial aspects most crucial aspects sorry technology development and innovation are the most crucial aspects needing the immediate attention of your youth like you i make sincere appeal to all of you especially the students to excel in science by putting your heart and soul and bring glory to our country by emulating great scientists like sir c v raman homi jahangir baba vikram sarabhai and our beloved former president a p j abdul kalam and continue the great legacy india deserves on the globe for example we are all not only state and central we are doing lot of work towards celebration of national mathematics day national science day why because we want more and more um, uh, that is uh, uh, like sir c v raman uh, you are some sort of uh, uh, nobel laureate we require we want because only one person so far we got nobel laureate in science but other uh, we are all also uh, work to ways to get like this but if you take homi ba jahangir baba because of him only we are uh, having a nuclear uh, energy and nuclear facilities and vikram sarabhai because of his uh, uh, important uh, his activities his sacrification we are launching lot of uh, vehicles and uh, space vehicles and we are doing wonders in uh, uh, isro isro and our beloved former president he is driving force for our uh, youth development uh, everybody knows that at the outset we all once again recollect the golden weights of bharat ratna dr apj abdul kalam ji unless india stands up to the world no one will respect us in this world fear has no place only strength respects strength climbing to the top demands strength whether it is to the top of mount everest or to the top of your career let us all follow this great man who made india proud i am to inform that tamil nadu state council for science and technology acts as a focal point for formulation planning coordination and the promotion of snd activities and helps in preparing state snd plans facilitating technological interventions disseminating innovation technology information and injecting scientific temper 
modern approach to chemistry and hands on training on solving spectroscopic problem today's workshop new tools and the products are developed by technologies every day that are becoming useful in research agriculture industry and the clinical side which in turn helps the betterment of human life modern bio and chemical technology provides breakthrough products and technologies to combat debilitating the rare disease reduce our environmental footprint feed the hungry use less and cleaner energy and have safer cleaner and more efficient industrial manufacturing process currently more than 250 bio health care products are available to patients patients many of which were considered as untreatable diseases not only in the healthcare field but also in agriculture more than 13.3 billion farmers around the world use agri biotech to increase the yields prevent crop damage from insects and pests and reduce farming impact on the environment biotechnology in the field that is helping to heal the world by harnessing nature's event toolbox and using our own genetic makeup to heal and findings research by reducing the rates of infectious disease solving millions of children's lives everything has become possible with the implementation of research areas such as biotechnology and genetic engineering it is possible to generate higher yields of crop with less input produce food free of allergens and toxins such as mycotoxin improving food and crop oil content to help improve cardiovascular health not only in healthcare research and development we have achieved great milestone but also in fueling the world by use of biofuels decreasing water usage reducing use and reliance of petrochemicals improving manufacturing efficiency etc by each and every advancement the new technology field is helping in improving the standard of human lives and is making the world a better and sophisticated place to live in it is a singular pleasure and a privilege to send a message of support and best wishes to the organizers and the participants of the of this workshop modern approach to chemistry and hands on training on solving spectroscopic problem i would like to express my profound support to all of its participants human kind is currently gambling away its future the present generation carries more responsibility than any other generation alive on mother earth before and you the participants of this conference at the forefront the entire planet is our common and we the human family must become its reward rather than it destroyers the students become familiar with the theoretical aspects and the principles in molecular molecules identification detection and isolation through various chromatographic techniques via physical and chemical methods further in modern we use spectroscopic method for the faster and to get the recent results in system with several bioinformatics tools they learn to use computer based approaches to address and solve problems in various fields of molecular biology they are also able to review and expand their knowledge of standard molecular techniques and are able to choose methods and techniques to design experiments in a specific research area the students learn to perform biogazard research assessments and to set up appropriate biosafety action they are aware of scenarios of in research and environment that may be associated with biological hazards molecular and bio, bio, biological sciences is a very important branch of science and is making rapid strides the knowledge growth in the subject and the research is tremendous and also fruitful technologies like molecular genetics dna sequencing biosynthesis whole genome sequencing molecular cloning robotics mass spectroscopy computational modeling genomics proteomics and a host of many other processes have contributed immensely for the widespread utility of plants and animals not only in providing the much essential food plants also provide us the natural medicines and the recent research has contributed to derivation of life saving medicines from plant extracts 
in organic chemistry the branch natural products is an important one but to most of us not interested to study and to practice in details in the research level all chemists should to focus in biological and biotechnology field as not only interdisciplinary but also you should work as transdisciplinary research work whenever you propose the research project it should focus on immediate societal need and it address the urgent need of improving our livelihood this will enable us to make the real assessment of the sustainability of the planet earth in the process we will also come across with several new inventions innovations and fruitful processes for the benefit of society and environment for this i urge upon all of you to take up interesting research projects to bring about outstanding advancement in molecular and biochemical sciences for the benefit of mankind and all the supporting systems on the globe my dear students and participants i would like to impress upon you on the important qualities that you must develop and continue throughout your life update yourself continuously develop interest even in your careers always interact with the experts scientists researchers in your field upgrade your knowledge worship your duty and be sincere be punctual and stick stick to the schedules of workplace be regular honest and result oriented i am sure by following these important characteristics you will excel in your career and attain higher positions i also make a sincere appeal to all of you to develop a sense of responsibility towards our great nation together we all will utilize our energies to make india a developed country where nobody suffers from hunger where every family has a house of their own where every child goes to the school where every student gets the opportunity of studying courses of their choice where all youth who have finished their education get an opportunity to find employment or self employment in their respective fields where all the citizens get the basic needs such as affordable medical treatment where all the citizens live in the country satisfactorily happily and proudly my advice to all please get patent if any research finding for societal important the basic taraka mantra of patent is before publishing any type of article you have to apply patent nowadays you can publish in patent journal in a month's time because earlier if you think of patent it requires four years five years lot of problem were there now very recently our patent office in chennai and in our government of india has recruited a lot of uh, patent agents and uh, uh, deputy controller like that they are all working together and they are doing lot of wonders nowadays you can usually get a patent within a year or two that is also if you submit properly with all the documents uh, definitely you will get in uh, time and also within a month you can publish if there is any urgency you can also publish and even your ugc is telling uh, that publication in uh, some exchanges or something like that you can show it this patent publication it is uh, uh, really it is having its own value wherever you go the patent uh, is very very important for your uh, updating your career further for this task you can approach our council any time we will extend the support both technical as well as financial if you apply to your institution copyright normally copyright just i want to tell one or two ideas for your development as well as your institution normally copyrights also very important you can also think it uh, most of our uh, chemistry uh, physics and the biological department you are also having uh, laboratory manuals useful for getting nac nrf it will be very much useful you just simply uh, send uh, an application with your uh, laboratory manuals to this council we will send it to you calcutta office you will be getting a, pet, a copyright within a month it also useful to you not only your uh, uh, individual uh, in, interest but also it will be useful your uh, institution trademark have you got or register your college emblem it is a very simple you can also think it of you are uh, you are having uh, your uh, bharati women's college is having some emblem 
that also you can uh, make as a uh, trademark uh, that, that is uh, for a uh, starting point you can uh, apply your uh, uh, emblem for uh, getting a trademark and as uh, rightly pointed out our uh, earlier speaker uh, we have find a kodaikanal we have uh, filed a kodaikanal garlic that is malai pundu uh, from kodaikanal region we have applied and we have, we got uh, we got a jar of indication of kodaikanal garlic malai pundu <laughs> because we have applied and get it uh, with a span of 8 months we got this gi the main importance is the extension of feces will be alive and the originality you can uh, preserve and uh, the normally the garlic is having lot of uh, medicinal activities like anti cancer activities and even uh, for uh, this pandemic situation uh, everybody should take uh, garlic and uh, ginger like that that is also uh, our ancient uh, practices and if you go to any uh, some 100 years back also if we refer some uh, some of our uh, uh, historical uh, development uh, the siddhas and uh, they are also telling a uh, lot of things the same way lot of drugs are coming up and we should be able to uh, do some pre clinical research and other activities so that we can also uh, get lot of uh, other ideas uh, not only for waiting uh, uh, this is uh, uh, waiting for uh, uh, drugs like vaccines you can also uh, do it uh, properly for Uh, increasing our immunity power and another one interesting is erode turmeric very recently we got a erode turmeric gi yeah. normally this type of uh, natural products you cannot patent it but we cannot patent it you should not uh, simply sleep because if you sleep other people will dominate always for small example erode uh, that is turmeric everybody knows that uh, that is manjal mahime everybody knows about in all our uh, uh, house itself all our uh, house people everybody knows about uh, this uh, uh, turmeric but uh, because we cannot do it by pattern everybody is sleeping but if you take uh, like uh, us people they are just finding out the what is the important available what ingredients available in uh, turmeric they are isolating they are studying the properties and they are combining with other protein molecule protein tonics and other things they uh, patented nearly some two three patents has been published last two three months that is for your information because but with some combinations with the protein and the tonic to improve improve immunity can be patented uh, that is for process and development that uh, it comes under that category and very recently we last uh, 17th we have uh, submitted one another uh, gi uttangudi karupatti or sorry udangudi karupatti palm jackery in lockdown period in the lockdown period itself we have applied because udangudi karupatti you know that in uh, tirunelveli region there we got a lot of evidences in earlier the british ruler they they have uh, uh, found that the area is having a very good potential of palm trees and they pro- they produce lot of things they have uh, provided the uh, railway service entire that uh, particular taluk and they they also uh, have a pipeline uh, facilities throughout that place and uh, it comes to one place uh, near uh, ciso and they have uh, uh, process it and that in the form of uh, palm jaggery they produce and they have taken to their country because for uh, all uh, Uh, some sugar patients and every, all these people can uh, use that palm uh, jaggery it will be very much useful it is having another uh, minerals also it is available and another one important thing i think time is there that the chromium cow urine you know that mostly people are taking uh, this type of things for uh, uh, fungicidal and uh, uh, herbicide uh, all these activities we are using but in us last month itself they produced the five patents by using this uh, covrain american got five number of patents recently for its anti fungal and anti bacterial activities that is very important because you see in and around even uh, your college your uh, uh, the researchers and uh, uh, staff members can think it of find out one ga because why i am interested in ga means 
we are in second place in geographical indication i want to take it our tamil nadu is a first because last year also two three ga we got this year also we are planning and i request uh, uh, bharati women's college to take up this task total entire uh, support we will provide from our council for your uh, uh, taking up work about our council i want to tell something about because we are having nearly 16 academic programs you please visit our website we are uh, very vibrantly doing lot of work for example we are also giving young scientist fellowship that is 2 months to 6 months you have to work with other leading national laboratories uh, other than tamil nadu for example indian institute of science icer iit you can approach there you get a letter and you get a letter from your head of the institution principal you apply because by applying this if you selected by this council uh, very easily your uh, principal also can deputy you to attend uh, uh, discuss with some uh, leading scientists in other institution even if you purchase some instrument which is having uh, some uh, uh, training or some uh, innovative approaches you can also uh, collaborate with other institution you can utilize for this we are giving 2 months to 6 months at a rate of 10000 rupees per month and uh, your traveling allowance and also we are giving travel grant to present the papers in national and international conference research fellowship for uh, example some research fellows are working in your uh, institution they are not able to get a fellowship you can uh, apply our uh, council the call for will be there every every july august you please apply Uh, we are giving 10000 rupees per month for 2 years that is 24 months and every year the contingency of 30000 you will be given nearly some 3 lakhs will be given and uh, every year we are giving conduct of seminars and conference grant is available and uh, science and technology many projects also we are uh, giving very recently we called for covid 19 project that also very important and uh, here uh, one thing i want to tell our researchers whenever you Uh, take uh, projects you find a problem which is immediately useful to our societal needs that is very important and the infrastructural development for laboratories also we are giving 5 lakhs we are selecting three institution that is especially government colleges only everywhere we are giving and application of science and technology uh, that is also uh, we are conducting and the teacher training program every year 10 districts we are selecting and we are selecting some 6th standard to 9th uh, standard those who are uh, sorry 6th to 8th standard those who are teaching uh, science subjects we are collecting some 50 faculties uh, from through school education department and we are giving a training in leading uh, any of our uh, colleges those who are having uh, uh, post graduate and uh, post graduate uh, laboratories at least three categories Uh, there we are conducting every year and also dissemination of innovation technology that is also we are giving nearly 18 program whenever you are having some innovation or improvement or which is useful to our society you can also approach us we will give a, a small amount to, to disseminate the technology to that particular area and further we are also having uh, lot of collaboration with dst dbt department of biotechnology and uh, other uh, leading research institutions and uh, funding agencies and other uh, ministries uh, we are nodal agencies so that if you have any problem to approach even bark brc baba atomic research center they are having lot of technologies which is to be uh, disseminate to our uh, entire country for example even in water technology they have uh, formulated one device that is one uh, filter which is very cheaper one and you can also approach them and uh, they are also having lot of uh, other uh, uh, research uh, facilities that also you can connect with your uh, department even physics chemistry biology you can combine and you can approach if you have any difficulties to approach them you can please you please uh, uh, contact us we will definitely help you to interconnect environmental protection is a great concern for all of us today gandhi ji predicted this long back and showed a solution for protecting the environment by his deeds one of his famous quotes read like this 
earth provides enough to satisfy every man's greed needs but not every man's greed hope we all follow this great message a good workshop is always more than just an exchange of papers and ideas it is the experience of a common belief nicely expressed in a quote of mahatma gandhi in a gentle way you can shake the well wishing you all the best my dear students i take this opportunity to thank the principal management dean research and all other academicians for providing me the opportunity to be with you on this great occasion thank you one and all thank you jai hind if you have any uh, doubt or something like that i can uh, i am uh, willing to uh, discuss in this forum any questions from the participants any questions from the participants participants can type it in the chat box any anybody wants to ask any questions to the sir if you have any problem to approach our council if you have any problem uh, getting some funds uh, already selected by council if there is any problem you can also uh, discuss here no problem <laughs> i think uh, finally i want to tell uh, one that, small sir there is one there is one question sir yes uh, all these applicable to tamil nadu only sir yeah definitely it is applicable to tamil nadu because uh, this council because all other uh, state also having their own council every state is having council you can approach your uh, concerned council புள்ளிங்க பாரதி மனசுல இருக்கீங்களே இதுதான் எவ்வளவு பேசலாம் தீபாலாம் தீபா சண்முக பிரியா ஒன் மோர் क्वेश्चन எஸ் will it pause will it be pause will it be possible to get post doctoral fellowship இதுங்களுக்கு ஒரு இது வந்துரும் அது பண்ண right now we don't have that facilities but we will think it we will think it and we will uh, try to get it பத்தா வரவே இல்ல சீன்லயே வரல பட் போஸ்ட் டாக் ஃபெலோஷிப் யூ கேன் அப்ரோச் சிஎஸ்ஐஆர் இருந்தாலும் நித்யாவையும் சீதே பத்தினா at right at the immediately at right now can we get the link they are asking for can we get the link thank you shrithi ma'am can you unmute yeah i have unmuted sir please unmute yourself sir so please unmute sir so shrinivasan sir please ah sorry sir ah ha sorry sorry Uh, they are asking for the link sir link means uh, uh, this uh, getting a post doctoral fellowship ah uh, yes i think so sir but normally for other than uh, india you you can approach you can approach the concerned universities and other things and in dst also there is a bridge program with the various other uh, countries you can apply there is a call every every time and you go to uh, dst website you can find uh, uh, this post doctoral fellowship program the same way you can also approach dst and uh, csr council of scientific and industrial research any other questions the participants and, yes sir uh, finally i want to tell one thing because most of uh, here most of the people participants are related to chemistry people am i correct Yes, sir. I my uh, compile records. Our chemistry people are uh, working hard. At the same time, they are not apply apply. Uh, they are not doing research in application oriented. We are all concerned with uh, only chemistry. Nowadays, if you take nanotechnology, the main task, the main uh, important thing is. mostly our chemistry people should be there in nanotechnology and nano science development one example i am telling but if you see the mechanical people mechanical engineering people and every people doing nano science and nanotechnology except the chemistry people chemistry people are also doing one or two but here you should also focus biological aspect for example our earlier nobel laureate wengi like wengetraman 
he has studied here one thing and he has gone to abroad and he interact with trans discipline i told you no trans disciplinary is very important you should also connect and combine with other field like science and other things you have to concentrate on that aspect because all people we are all doing uh, research for getting paper am i correct but you should also think it sometimes you have to sacrifice to do it some uh, innovative approach and uh, you have to concentrate just simply doing some kinetics sort of things but you have to uh, do some application oriented research that is very important that is why i just uh, gather combined all this uh, biotechnology and all these things i think our uh, uh, two guests they are uh, going to deal with a uh, uh, lot of uh, information for your uh, the uh, workshop related uh, spectroscopic and other uh, uh, innovative approach for chemistry here i want to tell uh, tell uh, uh, the all the students and the researchers whenever you find a time you just go to your laboratories not only your college but also other institution like uh, clr central leather research institute iit and you just go and uh, uh, contact with some uh, uh, researchers there you just interact with the instruments you just handle you just do some research activities so that the hands on experience is very very important rather than uh, theoretical aspect you should approach the concerned people and take help uh, help to interact with uh, some uh, research activities that's all thank you anything any other questions very very important rather than uh, theoretical aspect you should approach the concerned people and they can help uh, help interact with uh, some uh, that's all thank Sir, Mr. Abdullah, sir, your question is not clear. Are you asking question? <coughs> Any other questions? So, in the absence of any question, I take this opportunity. In the absence of any question, I take this opportunity to thank Dr. Srinivasan sir. He has been very cooperative and very accommodative. At any time, we can reach him. Thank you so much, sir. First of all, for supporting us for both the conference and the workshop, and for accepting an invitation to be a keynote speaker and inaugurate this conference. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Uh, and we hope that you have uh, you have kept so much of confidence in our college, and we hope that we uh, live up to your confidence and uh, do more projects associated with Tamil Nadu State Council. Thank you, sir. Sure, sure. Thank you. Uh, we will we'll be starting the next session participants please wait for a few minutes <coughs>
we are, we are waiting for the next speaker to join so please participants bear with us for a few minutes We'll start our next session. Uh, the next session is going to be a hands-on training, and uh, the keynote speaker for this session is. Yeah, not audible, Nitya. Yeah, one minute. Now, am I audible? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Okay, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Not audible. Ma'am said yes. Ah, uh, I can hear you, ma'am. Sri, ma'am. Participants, can you message in the chat box? Am I audible? Audible, audible. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I would like to call upon our uh, next uh, special guest, Dr. K. Geeta. She is a associate professor and head department of chemistry, Mutrangam Government Arts College. As she is a chemistry faculty. Not audible. Not audible. Today, ma'am, I'm audible to everybody. Yes. Today, ma'am, check your mic. Geeta ma'am. You are audible. Good morning. Yeah. You are audible. Thank you ma'am. Thank you ma'am. Sorry for the inconvenience. I would like to call upon Dr. K. Geeta. She is Associate Professor and Head, PG and Research Department of Chemistry Matrangam Government Arts College. As she is a chemistry faculty, she is more passionate towards the chemistry field. So chemistry worked out in her life very well. Why I'm saying this, she has a strong bonding with metal, especially with gold. The reason for this is she has received many gold medals in her academic period, uh, starting from the school, ending with the research PhD. In all the classes from 10, 12, BSc, UG, P, uh, UG, PG, PhD, in all the cases, she has received a gold medal. A great applause to her. And uh, she is a member in uh, many scientific uh, 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 scientific forums and she acted as an examiner in many universities and she acted as a resource person in many of the programs. Awards and certificates listed uh, so many to list out but here highlight, highlight only few things uh, because of the time concern and she has received outstanding professional award for the year 2016 by the JCI Vellore and uh, she has chosen as one of the five finalists by Pearson Teaching Award in the year of 2013 uh, under the category of innovation in teaching, especially for the PG graduates. And she is also awarded as a national best teacher award in the year of 2011 
by the Chemical Research Society of India, Bhuneshwar. And uh, along with that, she has awarded as a Tamil Nadu Young Women Scientist Award in the year of 2003. And she has received Boys Cast Fellowship from the Department of Science and Technology and Soundaraja Medal for her best thesis, uh, which she has performed in uh, IISC Bangalore. And uh, she has uh, participated in many national and international conferences and she has got the best presentation award. And uh, along with that, she has, uh, as I said, there is a, so many lists to list out her awards. But due to the time concern, I'll uh, go with, uh, uh, I'll ask Gita ma'am to share the spectroscopic, solving the spectroscopic problems for uh, UG and PG students. It's going to be a, a brainstorming session for all the students and I hope the, the participants will surely enjoy the session. Thank you. And uh, I request Gita ma'am to continue the session. Gita ma'am? Yeah, yeah. I'm... Yes ma'am. Very good afternoon to one and all. Respected principal ma'am, chief invitees, Dr. Srinivasan sir, member secretary of TNSCST, Dr. Pawel from UK, and the convener, Dr. Tarani ma'am, head of the department of chemistry, Dr. Sridevi and Dr. Nitya, the coordinators, and my dear participants. A very good afternoon to you all. At the onset, I would like to thank the Department of Chemistry for having given me this opportunity and especially uh, many thanks to Nitya for the kind introduction about me. Since it is a workshop, so this session is going to be uh, how to go about solving the CSAR problems. So we'll just see how we'll do, how to approach those to the solutions of CSAR problems. So with that, I'll move on to the presentation. Thank you. Uh, Nitiman, can you uh, enable the screen sharing? It has been disabled. Hello? Am I audible? Yes, ma'am, you are audible, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma can do it. I enable it. Yeah. Share. yeah, you can share it, ma'am. Yeah, yeah. Okay, thank you. Discuss today is CSAR inorganic and physical spectroscopic problems. And I have been always finding to him the aim of science is to seek the simplest explanation of complex facts. The facts may be very complex, but it is the ultimate aim of science to give a simple explanation. So, with that aim, let's move on to the topic. Now, I have taken few questions from previous CSAR questions. So, we'll be seeing one by one. Now, question number one is from June 2019. And here, the first question is, the correct statement about HCl and DCl among the following is, option A, DCl has a smaller zero point energy than HCl. Option B, HCl has smaller vibration frequency than DCl. Option C, the force constant K of the HCl bond is half that of DCl. Option D, the reduced mass of DCL is smaller than that of HCL. Now, in some way, the reduced mass is coming. So we'll start with the reduced mass. We know the reduced mass is given by the expression M1, M2 divided by M1 plus M2. Now here, the reduced mass for HCL, that means here one is going to be- Yeah. Uh, Mm 
Gita, ma'am. Gita, ma'am, please unmute yourself. Gita, ma'am, unmute yourself, ma'am. Yeah, yeah. Now, am I audible? Am I audible, Nitya, ma'am? Yes, ma'am. Okay, I'll proceed. Yes, 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 yes. Yeah, fine. So anyway, I'll start from here. The reduced mass is given by M1, M2 divided by M1 plus M2. Now for HCL, when you consider, this is the formula. And for mu DCL, it's going to be mass of deuterium into mass of chlorine and the whole thing. And we know there is a relationship between the mass of deuterium and the mass of hydrogen. We know it is mass of deuterium is twice the mass of hydrogen. So I'm just going to replace the mass of deuterium by 2mh over here. And here also it's going to be 2mh. Now I'm just going to take the ratio between the reduced mass of DCL and the reduced mass of HCL. I have substituted over here. And here if you see, you have on... 2mH MCL and you have here. So here, this is a common factor which I can just cancel it out. So finally, I'll be left here. Now here, if you see the numerator is greater than your denominator, so obviously this one is going to be greater than one. So our mu DCL will be greater than mu HCL. That means the reduced mass of deuterium chloride will, is going to be greater than HCL. But when you look at the option D, here it says the reduced mass of DCL is smaller. So you can just rule out option D. And we know like the IR specifically, you have the vibrational frequency is given by the Hooke's law. This is nothing but mu is equal to one by two pi square root of K by mu. When mu is directly proportional to your reduced, I mean say, uh, post constant and inversely related to your reduced mass. Now, already we have seen the reduced mass of DCL is greater than the reduced mass of HCL, isn't it? So, what will happen is, is since it is inversely related, so your stretching frequency for DCL will be less. Now, we'll go back to the question and see the stretching frequency, yeah. So I can rule out option B. And you know, energy is directly proportional to your stretching frequency because E is equal to H2 and zero point energy is equal to half H2. So your DCL is going to have smaller zero point energy than, sorry, this is going to be your correct answer. So A will be your correct answer. Fine. Now the correct option, Question for question number one is option A. Now next, question number two, we have it from December 2018. Here in the proton decoupled phosphorus 31 NMR spectrum of a diamantic complex, this complex is given here, the expected number of resonances. It's very simple. So first thing is you are supposed to know like how, how to draw the structure of meridone. So in this, what you have to see is the two of the things same ligand will be trans and one ligand will be cis to both of them. So this is the structure. When you talk about facial, all the ligands will lie on one face. So these, this is uh, what you can say, uh, synonym to trans also you can say when you have three ligands over here. Now, when you just want to identify how many unique kinds of phosphorus are there. So one is if I consider this phosphorus as A kind, so obviously this also belongs to the A kind. Whereas this PR3 belongs to the different types. So how many different types we have? We have, have two types of phosphorus. So you are going to expect two resonance. So your answer is option C. So that is the correct option. See, what happens is in certain cases, questions, you have to start solving them and arrive at the answer. But in certain cases, what you can do is you can basically just rule out certain options and arrive at the correct answers. Now here, if you 
Question number three is from December 2018. Here you consider the species NO I2, I2 minus Cu2 plus and VO2 plus. The number of paramagnetic among them and the EPR inactive species respectively are. You have been provided with the four options. Now we have to see and here you have to work it out. Now when I consider NO, here you have seven electrons and nitrogen and eight electrons with oxygen. So totally it works out to 15 electrons. So when you have iodine, here you have two iodine atoms. So that is one or six electrons. I2 minus means it has gained one electron. So it's going to be one or seven electrons. Copper, you know, it is atomic number is 29. And when you remove two electrons from it, Sorry for the inconvenience. Anyway, we'll resume. Here you have copper. We know the atomic number of copper is 29. And since it is 2 plus, you're going to remove two electrons. It's going to be 27 electrons. And we would 2, 2 plus. Here you know how to find out the oxidation state of vanadium. So here, X, let's assume it is X. X, you know the oxidation state for oxygen is minus 2. So X minus two is equal to plus two. So totally that becomes vanadium four plus, fine. So you know the atomic number for vanadium is 23. So when you remove four electrons from there, you will have 19 electrons. So if you see, these are all odd. NO, I2 minus, CO2 plus, and VO2 plus. So all these things, when you have odd number of electrons, that means unpaired electrons, we call them as paramagnetic because of presence of an unpaired electron, they become paramagnetic in nature. So in the question, they have asked how many among them are paramagnetic. So your option is going to be four. Now, when you look into the option A, B, C, and D, at outright, I can just rule out option C and option D. Now I'm left with option A and B. Now if here you see, how many are like obviously four are paramagnetic okay and inactive see this one you have to be very careful because the question is epr inactive species you have to say so when you look here iodine has got one or six electrons so all the electrons are paired so this is going to be inactive in that case your option a is wrong and your option b is the correct answer for question number three well, next we have question number four. Match the following complexes with the new CO stretching frequency. So here you are being given on one side the complexes and on the other side you are being given the carbonyl stretching frequency. So it's a very simple concept and many a times they ask questions based on the carbonyl stretching or maybe even in inorganic they ask about back bonding and so on. So what you have to consider is See, when you look into the complexes, you here you have same metal atom, okay? And common ligand is carbonyl. Only ligands which differ is this all phosphorus and you have pyridine over here. And when you closely look into this, you see that the pi acceptor capacity or the tendency of the ligands, they decrease in this order, fine? Okay, so now if I look into PF3, so that means it is going to attract the electrons towards itself because it's a pi acceptor ligand, it has got a greater tendency. So what happens is when it attracts here, the metal electron density decreases, isn't it? Because it's taking up the electron from the metal. And we know metal electron density is directly proportional to your back bonding. So when metal electron density decreases, your back bonding decreases. And once your back bonding decreases, 
you know back bonding is inversely proportional to your stretching constant okay stretching frequency so when back bonding decreases your stretching frequency will increase so for the complex a you are going to observe the maximum stretching frequency now you look into options you can see this has got the maximum one so this is for a now you look into the options option a is telling us one so i can rule out option a option b fine it's saying three we'll come to the later part like when we see so i'll just leave it here option c of course it's ruled out and then option d yeah it's also going to be ruled out now when you look into option b here it is a matches with the third now you see next you have pome3 so after this which value is coming this one so this one will match with b okay after this 1835 so c and after this you have now you can see the whole thing matches with your correct option b so for question number 4 the correct option is b next we have question number 5 from december 2018 here the new cn n complex a and complex b they have given and new co n complex c and complex d are compared now you have to arrive at the pair of the correct answer okay fine here also same concept you are going to apply now if you see here fe is in plus 3 oxidation state and in complex b fe is in plus 2 oxidation state so where do you think the electrons density is going to be greater it's going to be greater in complex b fine so here electron density is greater so when metal electron density is greater back bonding is going to be greater and when back bonding is greater the stretching frequency is going to be less so compared to a and b the stretching frequency of b will be lesser than a so i can rule out option c and option d fine now i'm left with option a and b now here you see in option c and d both are chromium fine and both are neutral here i cannot think of talking about the oxidation state and common ligands are carbonyl of course but here you have nh3 ligands be the sites carbon monoxide so you have to know the nature of nh3 we know nh3 is a very good base what we say is because of electrons to the chromium as a result the electron density on the metal will increase so back bonding increases and the stretching constant or the stretching constant decreases and your stretching vibration of carbonyl decreases fine so now you look into this between c and d for c the stretching frequency has to be less so which one is correct option b is correct and option a is wrong so for question number 5 the correct option is b next we have question number 6 now here arrange the following in the order of increasing fundamental stretching frequency now this question we all know like it's a very uh, simple question if you think in terms of bond order see in every question if they are going to give you four marks or two marks not just based on one concept you are supposed to know two or three concepts and cumulatively you have to apply them and then you get your marks fine now here if i see it's all oxidant related things now here first you have oxygen then o2 plus then o2 minus then o2 2 minus so here if i see o2 we know it has got 16 electron and o2 plus means it is less one electron less so 15 electrons o2 minus means you have Two el uh, one electron more that is seventeen electrons. O to two minus means you have two electrons more that is eighteen electrons. Now based on this, you know the stretching frequency is directly proportional to your force constant. You know, 
and force constant is directly proportional to your bond order fine so now how to calculate the bond order you need not have to spend so much of time working because it happens when you have to answer long questions you have to work it out but when you are going for a multiple choice questions you should always see how shortcut way in shortcut ways you should be able to arrive at something so this is uh, a simple way to remember we all know nitrogen has got 14 electron and its bond order is 3 now you can start writing it what you can do is on this side you increase the number of electrons on this side you decrease the number of electrons and from here you start decreasing the bond order by 0.5 2.52 1.51 1. and here again you start decreasing the bond order fine so now you know from here you can get o2 plus 2.5 o2 2 then o2 minus 1.51 fine so in this way your bond order is decreasing fine so when you consider o2 2 minus this is having the least bond order when the bond order is least for cause force constant is less and your stretching frequency is in the less so that means it's the least one but when you look at the options you can see option b has the maximum value for o2 to minus so i can rule it out and op option b also has o2 to minus as maximum value so that can be ruled out now coming to option a and b yeah it is least but then you look at the o2 plus now o2 plus will have maximum new value okay so i just see o2 plus maximum new value yeah it is there in option a so i'm going to take it and it is not there in option c i'm going to rule it out so finally i'm left with the option a which is the correct answer for question number 6 well next let's move on to question number 7 which is from december 2018 the third and the fourth line in the rotational raman spectrum of carbon monoxide are separated by 8 cm inverse the carbon monoxide bond is given by you have been given options now here if you see this is the raman spectrum we all know as priyavana uh, the dr shrinivasan sir he was talking he referred about tv raman sir and also he is responsible for this and we have here the raman lines so this one is a rale line and these stokes and anti stoke lines are the raman lines fine so when you consider the energy required for the transitions from ground state to the excited state we have stokes line when you come from the excited to the ground state we have anti stokes line and the how do you say um the selection rule the delta j is equal to plus or minus 2 and this delta e is given by the expression b into 4j plus 6 and b is the rotation constant now here if you come for 0 to 2 here you have 6b it works out 1 to 3 10b 2 to 4 14b and 3 to 5 18b now we have to see this is between the third and the fourth line so first second third and fourth line so third and fourth line what is the difference it is third and fourth you have it as 4b isn't it now here if you see 4b is given by 8 cm inverse so 4b is equal to 8 cm inverse or i can say b is equal to 2 cm inverse now the rotation constant is given by the expression h by 8 pi square i c where i is a moment of inertia and i is given by this expression that is equal to mu r square where r is the bond length okay so b is equal to h by 8 pi square instead of i i am just replacing it by mu r square c and here i have just rearranged i brought the b at the denominator and mu in the oh sorry r square on the left hand side so here if you see you have h by 8 pi square b, b c now substitute the value of b as 2 cm which works out to be h by 16 pi square mu c it is r square so if you want to take r you have to 
put the square root on the right hand side and you get your options. Now you look at the option. Yeah, it matches with option A. So that is your correct answer. Fine. There's so many things you have to know to arrive at the answer. And this is possible when you just thoroughly go along. And spectroscopy especially is a very interesting topic. Once you understand, it will be very interesting and you feel loving, you feel love to do all these problems. Okay, next we have question number eight. Now the for electronic spectra of K2CrO4A, that's A, and you have potassium molybdate, which is B, the correct combination is. Now when you look here, the options, A, B, C, D, they have given, now we'll go step by step. When you see chromate, chromate is CrO4 2 minus and molybdate is MoO4 2 minus. When you, chromium here, what is the oxidation state? Now we all know how to calculate the oxidation state. X minus eight is equal to minus two, that is equal to plus six. So you know, chromium has an electronic configuration of 4s2, 3d4. When you remove six electrons, it becomes 4s2, 3d, sorry, 4s2, 0, 3d0. So you don't have any electron over there. And oxygen, we know it is 2s2, 2p4. And when it gains two electron, it becomes 2s2, 2p6. Similarly, for molybdate, MO6 plus is 5s0, 4d0, and O2 minus, you have got it. Okay. Now, since in both the cases, chromate and molybdate, you don't have any D electrons. When there are no D electrons, you know there is no possibility of DD transition, so I can omit option A. And since there are no D electrons, it cannot give it to the ligand. So there is no possibility of metal to ligand charge transfer back, fine? So you are left with only ligand to metal charge transfer and B and C, both options, they're speaking about ligand to metal charge transfer. Now, when you compare between A and B, now here in the A, the energy difference between 3D and 2P is less, okay? When it is less, what will happen? Your wavelength will be high. So for A, the lambda max is greater for A compared to B, isn't it? So you can take this answer and omit option B. So your correct option for question number eight is option C. Next, we have question number nine, one of the very easy question. And you know how many marks they had allotted for this? It is four marks. So sometimes you may be lucky enough to get questions like this too. The number of lines in EPR spectrum of CD3 radical, ID is given as one S. Now, you should know when you there is going to be a splitting, number of hyperfine splittings, then that is given by the expression 2Ni plus 1, where N stands for number of the splitting nucleus, and I is the I, I value for the split, splitting nucleus. So you have two, how many deuterium? Three deuterium into one because ID is one. So two into three into one plus one. So that works out to be seven. So your correct option is C. Next we have question number 10. Now this is from December, 2017. Here the IR spectrum of CO I mean, so this complex, carbonyl complex, shows bands at the values they have given. And here they have asked you to find the new cobalt deuterium stretching expected in this complex. Now, the only difference from this complex and this complex is instead of hydrogen, you have deuterium. And when you look into the stretching frequencies, we know all this are for carbonyl. So we'll go with the last one. So here, now, since you're going to talk about the stretching frequency. Now, what is the difference here? Cobalt, hydrogen, cobalt, deuterium. So in that case, when you have two different atoms across a single bond, in that case, you have to think about the reduced mass. So now you, we know the stretching frequency is inversely proportional to your reduced mass. Now, if you take a ratio of mu COH and the frequency of the cobalt deuterium, 
that's going to be square root of mu, the reduced mass of cobalt deuterium by, divided by square root of reduced mass of cobalt hydrogen. Hence, so reduced mass One second. Anyway, I think I'll just stop here for a break. Um, so we'll continue in the next one. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Sridhar, ma'am. Yeah. Yeah, yes, sir. Uh, thank you, Geeta, ma'am. Uh, let's have a break um, in that session. And we now invite Dr. Dylan Powell Williams for the meeting. Dr. Dylan Powell Williams is a National Teaching Fellow, Associate Professor, Director of LNT, Study Abroad Tutor, Chair of Learning and Teaching Committee, Chemistry, and he has done his MChem, PhD from Liverpool, and PG certification from Leicester. He's a group leader in the research group of Leicester Chemical Learning Enhancement and Pedagogy. He has won many awards. He's a winner of the Teaching Excellence Award in 2019-20. And um, he is in, uh, got the Royal Society of Chemistry Higher Education Training Award in 2018 and HEA National Teaching Fellow in 2017 and the winner of the HEA Collaborative Award for Teaching Excellence Interdisciplinary Science Teaching Team. And he has won a John Holloway Teaching Award from the University of Leicester for a few consecutive years, 13, 14, 14, 15, 17, 18, 18, 19. The speciality of this is it's a student nominated teaching award. And his research interests are pedagogy and chemistry education. Personally, I know Dylan as a very friendly person, a very good associate. I had been associated with him when I was in the University of Leicester as an academic visitor in the study abroad program. He's a down to earth person, very accommodative, and very friendly and a very good teacher. I have listened to many of his lectures. Very, very good teacher. Welcome you, Dylan. Welcome you for this workshop. Over to Dylan. Thank you very much. Uh, can I just confirm everyone can hear? Uh, louder, a bit louder, please, Dylan. A bit louder. Can, is that okay? Yeah. Fantastic. Excellent. So thank you very much for inviting me to speak today. Uh, a fantastic honor to be invited. Um, what I'm going to do, I'm going to talk about a few projects that I have led at Leicester to uh, improve the student experience in our chemistry degree programs. Uh, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the background to those projects. I'm going to talk about why we did them, uh, what the motivation was, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about the detail of what it was that we actually did. So. Um, I'll work my way through this presentation that hopefully everyone can see. And I'll start off with a little bit of background information about uh, how chemistry was taught maybe when I was doing my undergraduate degree. So I graduated as an, uh, with a MChem degree uh, in 2003 from the University of Liverpool. And at that time, chemistry was still very traditionally taught. It was still using the same uh, teaching methods in the UK that we had been using maybe 50 years or even 100 years earlier. So most of my teaching experience as an undergraduate student was sat in a lecture theatre listening to someone talking to me. Uh, I obviously spent a lot of time in the laboratory as well, so I had quite an extensive teaching laboratory programme in my early years of my degree. We had some small group teaching, so we had some sessions where we discussed problems uh, similar to those you've just seen in the last session, those exam questions. So we discussed problems based on the lecture material in small teams. And then as we got to the end of our degree, we worked on independent research projects. And that is how it was when I was an undergraduate. And that model hadn't changed for a very, very long time before then. It's the way chemistry had been taught for a very, very long time. So there's a lot of... Um, what we might call transmissive education there are a lot of didactic education where there is someone stood at the front of a room telling the students about the material and there's not really very much time for the students to work on their understanding of that material a lot of that had to be done uh, independently in private study 
So why did we change that? What has happened in the last 20 years or so that has driven us to change that? Well, for one thing, uh, the ways we recruit students in the UK have changed quite a lot since the late 20th century. So the UK government made changes to open up uh, higher education to more of the population, to make it less exclusive, if you like. And to do this, they changed the way we pay fees. So they, um, they actually eliminated loans that uh, students needed to take out to go to university. And they started uh, recruiting very heavily from local schools in areas that were unrepresentative at uni unrepresented at university. So we call this program widening participation. And the idea was we were bringing students from poorer backgrounds, students who were from demographic groups that were less represented at university. We were encouraging them to apply to go to university. So all of a sudden, after five or 10 years of these widening participation measures, we had a lot more students at university and we had students with very different educational backgrounds going to university. They didn't all go to um, exclusive schools anymore. A lot of them went to national schools now. So we had to think about what would have best ways to teach these students at university. In addition to that, the Royal Society of Chemistry and the UK Higher Education Academy did some research on the skills that chemistry students get when they graduate. So what skills do chemistry graduates have and how do they use them in the workplace? And it became apparent from that research that there was a gap between the skills that we were training our students to have upon graduation and the skills that employers needed chemistry graduates to have. So the expectations of the employers and the expectations of the educators were diverging. They were moving in different directions. And we weren't doing a good enough job as educators to train our uh, graduates to go and do the jobs that 21st century employers needed them to do in the UK. In addition to that, there was a lot of pedagogical research, a lot of fundamental research on the uh, effectiveness of traditional methods of teaching the subject. So one of these is the very famous um, Freeman et al. paper from the protocol, uh, Protocols of the National Academy of Science. So this is a uh, University of California uh, publication from 2014, and they essentially stated that traditional didactic methodologies were much less effective than active learning methods where students are encouraged to uh, actively engage their, uh, in their learning, to solve problems, to work together, to collaborate. So we had a number of different motivations for uh, implementing change. And what we did, we reflected on all of these different factors and we relaunched our degree <laughs> programs. So we instituted what we call a curriculum transformation project. And some of the key aspects of that project are shown on this slide. So I've got three key highlights from that project. First is inquiry-based induction. This is where we put students in teams as soon as they arrive at university, and we get them to work on a number of mini projects in their early stages of their university education. So we get students to work on a number of different small team focused projects, developing some kind of product at a very early stage. So they're learning a lot of key skills, including um, interpersonal skills, communication skills, they're learning how to work with a diverse group of other people within a team, and they're learning how to apply their understanding of chemistry to form a product, to create a product. And I'll come back to that a little bit later. I'll talk about an example of that later on. Another thing that we felt was very important uh, as part of our curriculum transformation was the relaunch of the way we prepared students for laboratory teaching. So we redesigned how we prepared students to go into the lab to do their teaching lab experiments. And we did this in collaboration with uh, a private company who developed some software for us. And we embedded some simulations, some simulated versions of lab experiments into our virtual learning environment. And I'll show you an example of that later. And I'll talk a little bit about the impact that had on our students. And the third big thing that we wanted to achieve from our curriculum transformation was to better embed 
employability within our curriculum. So to better prepare our graduates for the jobs that were waiting for them, to make sure that they had the right skills, the right experience. And that included uh, the um, promoting the opportunity to go and do an industrial placement during the degree, but it also included integrating a lot of workplace skills training directly into our program. And we did that in collaboration with some industrial partners and you'll see where we've done that as I as I work through this. So that's a lot of background there and I thought well, what, what would be nice to show you now is what the situation was at Leicester. So this is a little bit of um, research I did with one of our new intakes of students, uh, I think this was three academic years ago. Uh, so I, uh, as soon as the students arrived in their first week in their induction week, I gave them a questionnaire and I asked them what they expected the course to look like. So I said, uh, I gave them a series of different statements, uh, each one of which starts with, I expect my course to include a significant amount of, and then the statements you can see along the bottom of this uh, plot are uh, the ends of those sentences. So the first one is memorizing facts and information, second one is application of understanding, and so on. So I was asking students whether they thought or whether they expected these things to be important parts of their chemistry degree program. And I've plotted this as percentage agreement, and you can see the majority of them, it's exactly as you'd expect, students who apply to do chemistry appreciated the fact that most of these things are very important, integral parts of a chemistry degree. In fact, everything gets a score of 82% and higher, apart from the two right in the middle, apart from opportunities to be creative and opportunities to communicate science verbally. Those are the only two that fall below 82%. And those are the two that I'm interested in, because the rest of them, they're all things that I think it's very well publicized, a chemistry degree will include. Uh, a lot of them are very, it's quite logical that they would form part of a chemistry education. However, it's clear that a substantial number of our students fail to appreciate the fact that they were going to be engaging in these kinds of activities. They didn't see chemistry as a creative subject. 50% of our intake failed to recognize that chemistry would give them chances to be creative. And that worries me, that concerns me, because it is our responsibility as chemists to solve problems. And it's our duty to society to apply our understanding in constructive ways that solve societal problems. So to have an intake where 50% of the students don't think they're gonna be creative, it worries me. And I, it made me think we have to do something to, uh, to improve the situation, to change their opinions. It's also interesting that over a quarter of our incoming students didn't think they would be communicating their scientific understanding verbally. And that again was very surprising to me. Um, clearly students expect to take exams and exams in the UK are almost exclusively written. Uh, and that's how students take exams in school, in college, in university. So they're trained in that approach, but they didn't appreciate the fact that they would also be assessed on how they presented their scientific understanding in a speech or in a conversation with a group of people. So again, I felt that this was another immediate area for further work. And in order to uh, improve this situation, in order to develop the opportunities for students to uh, gain a deeper understanding of how to apply, uh, how those uh, co concepts or skills apply to a chemistry degree, I developed a series of context and problem-based learning exercises. And we call context and problem-based learning CPBL because it's, it's nice and easy to say, it's easier to say it than the whole name. We've been using CPBL in one way, shape or form since 2007. So 2007 was actually when I started working at Leicester. And when we started using it, we did it, um, we, were, we were experimenting, essentially. We did it very carefully. We very gradually introduced it. We made a lot of mistakes along the way. We introduced some things that didn't work very well. But we've been doing it for 13 years now, since 2007. And we've learned a lot about how it works effectively. And one of the key things we've learned is when you write a PBL problem or a CPBL problem, it's very important that you include all of the relevant stakeholders. So we get industrial partners to help us co-author these PBL activities to ensure that they uh, achieve the goals that we set out to achieve. And our aims are summed up in this diagram over on the right hand side of the slide. So we want to give students a chance to communicate their scientific understanding. 
we want to give them opportunities to work with other people and to learn how to work effectively with other people. We want to raise that awareness of business, industry, and actually I'd go one step further and say how chemistry applies to societal problems as well. And we want our students to be creative and we want them to gain experience of being problem solvers. And we address this very early on in our degree program. So you, if you're interested in what we did initially in the first few years we ran PBL, you can see there's a citation to a paper we published at the bottom of the page there that's published in Chemistry, Education, Research and Practice. And that journal is free to access. Uh, all you need to do is to sign up for an account and you can access those, uh, those papers free of charge. It's, it's published by the Royal Society of Chemistry. So why did we use CPBL? What was it about CPBL that appealed to us? Well, we went back to the literature and we looked at which pedagogical models best fitted our goals. And we immediately discovered that CPBL gave students the opportunity to adapt and participate to change. So it gave them the opportunity to be dynamic problem solvers, to work with rapidly changing situations and to apply their understanding of the subject in order to develop the best possible solution. It gave students the opportunity to deal with problems and also to make decisions in unfamiliar situations. Now, that was something that was very important to us. We wanted our students to be able to, to be comfortable dealing with unknowns and to have strategies for, uh, for dealing with unknowns. Because it was diff very different to working on their exam questions. Their exam questions typically have a very definite answer. They have a right answer and any other answer is wrong. These problems might have a range of right answers. We wanted students to be uh, familiar and comfortable with that scenario. We wanted our students to be able to reason critically and creatively. We wanted them to work in teams effectively so collaboration was important and we also wanted them to be able to reflect on their own skill set and their own development so we wanted them to develop as reflective practitioners and to be able to identify their own strengths and to recognize their weaknesses and to understand what they can do to address those weaknesses so when we get students to work on cpbl problems we adopt a very specific strategy. So the strategy we developed is shown, is summarized in the diagram on the right hand side of the slide. And you can find details of this in the citation at the bottom of the slide. Again, this is published in a free, uh, a free to access journal. This is published in the Student Engagement in Higher Education Journal. That is completely free to access. You don't even need to sign up for an account to download those. So the three key aspects of any good CPBL problem are planning, and this involves discussion within the team. Research, which involves addressing the issues that that discussion has highlighted. And development and reflection, which is where the teams review their progress, discuss what they still need to do, update their plans and continue to work on the problem. And this manifests itself in the form of a cyclic process that we can see in the uh, diagram over on the right hand side. And typically, students would have to go several times through this cyclic process in order to come up with a viable solution to the problem. The whole time they're working on the problem, the students are supported by either a member of faculty staff or one of our graduate teaching assistants, a PhD student who has been trained to teach. So we call those people facilitators and they help guide students through the process, but it's important that the facilitator doesn't direct the students to a particular answer. In order to help students document this, we give them a very specific way of recording their progress through the problem. So we obviously give them the problem statement and we give them time to read it. We then ask them to summarize the problem in one or two sentences. So a very short, punchy statement, which they come up with themselves as individuals. They then discuss those individual uh, summaries and they come up with an agreed group summary to the problem. And they write that at the top of this piece of paper that we give them. So we call this an SET sheet, the sheet that's shown on the right hand side here. And the S section is where they write their agreed group summary of the problem. They then identify what existing knowledge they can use to solve the problem. They list that down the left hand side. So these are the things they can already do or they already know that will help them. And they list those on the left hand side. And then their action points, the things that they need to go out and do. So the work they need to do or the research they need to do, that goes into the T column on this piece of paper. And this acts as their um, 
essentially their group contract. This is what they are committed to doing. This is where their actions are documented. And as they work through the problem, they should be able to cross off those actions as they are done. So I mentioned an induction activity earlier in the talk. And uh, this is how we introduce students to CPBL. And this is what we do in the very, very early stages of their degree. So at the same time that they're still having normal chemistry lectures, I'm teaching them quantum chemistry, for example, at the same time this is going on. But in the same weeks, we also have some sessions devoted to CPBL. And the induction activity lasts for six weeks. And it involves the design, development, and evaluation of a learning resource. So this is something the students are going to develop. And it could be uh, a booklet. It could be a game. It could be a video or a podcast. Whatever it is, it doesn't matter. It's completely up to the students what format they adopt. And the subject area is also up to the students. Now, it has to be something relevant to the course that they are studying. So it has to be something relevant to general chemistry. But the specific focus doesn't matter. It could be inorganic, organic, physical, analytical, up to the students to decide that. The target audience are their fellow year one students. And we tell them it has to work in a way that would be deliverable on a 20-minute bus commute from our university accommodation to our city centre campus. Well, after the initial design of the uh, product, the students create, uh, students deliver a pr presentation to the rest of their cohort. So we do this in the format of a very popular television programme called Dragon's Den, where they have to present their idea as though it were a business idea and their audience tell them whether they would buy into that idea or not. So they tell them what's good about their idea, but they also tell them maybe what's lacking about the idea. And that gives the group a chance to go away, think a little bit more about their plan, and to address those concerns that were raised by the audience. And again, you can find out more information about this activity in the Journal of Chemical Education. I published this in 2017, and the paper's called Learn on the Move. So when I evaluated this problem, I did the evaluation over the course of two academic years, uh, 168 respondents. Students were very positive about their skills development. 77.4% of the students agreed it helped them develop a project plan. Uh, almost 77% agreed that it helped them discuss science with students. Se uh, almost 76% said it helped them reinforce existing knowledge. And if, it sounds trivial, but it's very important to me. Over 88% agreed that it was a good way to meet new friends. The interesting response there is the second one, discuss science with a facilitator. Remember, facilitators are staff or PhD students. Only 39.9% agreed that it helped them discuss science with uh, the facilitator. And actually, that looks like a bad result. I consider it a good result because I want them to be discussing science amongst themselves, and I don't want them to be depending on interaction with their instructor to, uh, fac uh, to uh, uh, facilitate that discussion. So I want them to be talking to their peers in these sessions. That's exactly why we do PBL, to create time and space for them to discuss their scientific understanding with their peers. Uh, this evaluation was written up in a New Directions paper, which is cited at the bottom. Again, that one is free to access. Now, in terms of the longer term outcomes, because I often get asked about this, I often get asked, so what, what's the big picture? What happens to your students after first year? Uh, so what I did, I looked back at the um, statistics on where our graduates go after they finish their degree. So in the UK, the government compiles very detailed statistics on what proportion of graduating students get jobs. And they also compile statistics on what proportion of graduating students get what we call highly skilled jobs. Highly skilled jobs are jobs that typically require a degree to do. So they are gradu proper graduate roles. So the left-hand plot shows uh, employability in total. So these are the proportion of students who go into some form of job, graduate or non-graduate job, 18 months after they leave university. And the numbers are consistently pretty good, but there is a slight increase over time. So as we introduce more and more CPBL activities, those numbers do slightly increase to the point where we had 98.3% employability in the last set of data that we, uh, we were given. The uh, metrics on the right hand side, these represent the highly skilled uh, jobs. These are jobs that require a 
a degree to, uh, to go into. And what you can see is there is a steady increase year on year in the percentage of students who graduate with chemistry degrees from Leicester going into those types of roles. We're actually third best in the whole UK now for that statistic. And we attribute much of that to the training we give them in the CPBL sessions that we introduce. So I'm going to change focus for uh, the last part of the talk, and I'm going to talk about laboratory preparation. I'm going to talk about what we do to help prepare our students for teaching lab experiments. And what we did, we reviewed the overall lab experience and we thought carefully about, well, what is the process that we expect our students to engage with when they go into the teaching lab? And we broke that down into different elements and we thought, well, a very important aspect of it is preparation. What do the students do before they go into that lab environment? We also thought carefully about what, did, what do they do when they're in the lab? And obviously they, they, they experiment when they're in the lab, they do uh, a, a, an actual scientific experiment. They might also analyze when they're in the lab. They might start to analyze some data, for example, or some uh, spectral results. That analysis may continue after the lab and that will feed into the write-up of the experiment, the assessment of the experiment. So there's essentially three phases is what students do before they arrive, what students do while they're in the lab and what they do after they're in the lab. And what we recognized from our uh, review that we did of this, we recognized that there was further work that we could do to help students in the preparation. And there was also some opportunities for further work for what we could do to help them when they're in the lab. So we devised a new uh, structure for every one of our experiments at year one and year two level. So, Sir, not audible. Sorry? Only video clearance. Sorry, I didn't get that. No, it's audible only. Sorry? You're audible, you can continue. You can continue, Dylan, you can continue. Okay. Thank you. Um, okay, so I've got, um, this is divided up into three general types of preparation activity. So the top two, laboratory manual and pre-entry quizzes, these are uh, resources that we give to our students to help them prepare for the laboratory class. So the manual gives them some background on the experiment, gives them instructions, it might include some pictures of the types of things that the students will be doing when they're in the lab. The pre-entry quizzes, they are uh, short tests that we get students to do before coming into the lab, which ensure that they understand what it is that they're going to be doing, uh, what the background theory is, and they understand the safety aspect of the experiment. The blue boxes were entirely new uh, when, we, when we revised the curriculum three years ago. So these are things that we introduced just three years ago. We introduced a series of instructional videos. So we recorded a series of videos which demonstrated how to use particular sets of equipment, how to set up equipment, how to use it, how to do different techniques in the lab. And we made them available to our students in advance of their time in the lab. We also introduced simulated versions of techniques or full experiments that allowed students to practice the experiment in a safe environment. So they did it online before coming to the lab. We also improved the in-lab experience by developing a series of detailed demonstrator briefings. So these are essentially mini lectures, they're 15 minute talks that the demonstrator, the faculty demonstrator who is leading the experiment gives the students before they start working on the experimental work. So I'm gonna focus on the simulations because the simulations are the most innovative aspect of this. And that this is the biggest change from what we had previously done. Simulations are created by a company called Learning Science who are based in uh, Bristol in the UK. And we first purchased the license for their simulations in January, 2017. Some of the simulations we used had been created by uh, learning science for use at other universities, and they were, they were also useful for us. But some of the simulations were developed specifically for Leicester. So we worked with learning science to develop some new ones. And you can see some students using our simulations in the two pictures on the right. Top picture, uh, you can see one of our students, uh, Nikita, who's at home, and she's doing the uh, simulation as a, a preparation activity. Now, 
the bottom picture is quite different because the bottom picture is actually in our teaching lab. So you can see two students essentially refreshing their understanding of the subject by engaging with the simulation while they're in the lab. And this is another thing that we encourage students to do. If they need to uh, gain a deeper understanding of how to use a tool or a technique when they're in the lab, we have computers available for them to rerun the simulations. Simulations are signposted, so we tell students which experiments they're relevant to. We encourage them to use them for, uh, to help them understand how to set up experiments, how to uh, use equipment, and they prove to be very effective and very popular. So this is an example of one of our simulations, and it just plays through as an animation. You can see the first time it's attempted, the student has got the uh, has set the equipment up wrong. They then get some feedback that allows them to have a second attempt and the second attempt they correct what they got wrong first time and they get it right. So this just keeps playing through. I'll leave it on so you can uh, continue to see it just in case you didn't catch it first time. But this is a great illustration of how students can learn from engaging with these simulations. They control all of the settings. They manipulate the equipment in the simulation. They can uh, control the rotary evaporator in this particular simulation. And if they make a mistake, they will get told about it at the end. And then they'll be asked to do it again. And they'll be asked to do it again, taking into consideration the feedback that they've already been given. And what we found is by giving students the opportunity to do this and by giving them this level of feedback, they are less likely to make the same mistake with the real piece of equipment when they come into the lab. So it prepares them for the real lab experience better than anything we've done before. So in terms of what we discovered, <coughs> excuse me, in terms of what we discovered when we analyzed student use of this, we found we actually used it just for one term. We used it for uh, one 11 week term. And during that time, we had over 4,000 uh, logins to the simulation. And we don't actually have a very big number of students. We have, uh, we have around 100 in first year. We have around 100 in, in second year as well. So we have about 200 students in total taking the, two, uh, the modules that were going on at this time. But we had over 4,000 hits on these. I think someone's annotating my slide. Uh, I'm not sure going on there but okay um so when we analyzed the number of views and the uh and the, the the number of students that we had we had a mean of 5.1 views per week per student so it's clear that most students were accessing the simulations multiple times students indicated that they were engaging with the simulations for about 10 to 20 minutes the day before each lab session and the average number of views per student was highest among those that had a self-identified learning difficulty. So these are students with dyslexia or dyspraxia or attention deficit disorder, for example. Sorry, I was getting a bit of distortion there from somewhere. Um, the pattern of how the simulations are worked, uh, sorry, I've skip forward a slide, I shouldn't have done that. The pattern of how simulations were viewed was slightly uh, predictable. So students were typically most likely to view the simulation the day before they went into the research, uh, before the day they went into the lab. Uh, lab. So you can see simulation uh, usage according to lab day. This is for our first year students. Lab day is Wednesday. So there was still quite a significant amount of access on Wednesday itself, but the highest a single figure is the Tuesday usage, the day before. Uh, in terms of the Likert questions that we asked our students to evaluate this, we asked them about their confidence, and we noticed that uh, before the introduction of the simulations, after the introduction of the simulations, we saw an increase in the student confidence in terms of setting up experiments. We also asked students about how effective they thought our pre-lab activities were uh, preparing them for entry into the lab and we asked them before we started using the simulations we asked them again after the simulations had been uh, introduced and we saw a 10 percent increase in student agreement that we were giving them an effective uh, preparation activity if you're interested in reading more about this uh, 
myself and two of my colleagues wrote this up as a Journal of Chemical Education article, which was published last year. So please do uh, please do take a look at that. And these simulations are now very, very widely in use by a lot of universities across the world. When we started using them, we were one of very few universities to use them, but now they're very, very popular. Uh, so I'm just going to wrap up by acknowledging all the important people uh, who have helped out over the years. Royal Society of Chemistry have helped out with funding numerous times. The National HE STEM project in the UK also provided funding at the turn of the last decade. Uh, Barbara, Richard, Derek and Di Davis, all Leicester-based academics who have been uh, either collaborators with myself or they've been mentors to myself, Derek and Di in particular have long-time mentors. Uh, Sarah Simmons, who's at McMaster uh, in Canada, she has worked with us very closely on development of CPBL resources. Uh, Johnny Woodward, who is over in Tokyo, uh, he was, uh, when I started working at Leicester, he was my line manager. Um, Gero in Freiburg in Germany, who, uh, who co-authored some of our CPBL activities and has since translated some of our CPBL activities in, into German and used them uh, in his own university. Kevin Parker, who is our regular industrial partner. Most importantly, of course, our students and all of our trial partners for our new activities. And you can see some of our graduating class on the right hand side there. And of course, thank you very much to all of you for uh, inviting me along today and for listening to my uh, to my talk. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dylan. Thank you very much welcome. for coming here amidst a busy schedule. Thank you no so problem. much. <laughs> I hope to meet you soon in some other program. Thank you very yes. much, Dylan. No it problem. was a very informative speech. Participants, any questions to Dylan? Kindly post it in your chat box. Okay, since there are any uh, no questions from the participant side, I thank you once again, Dylan. Thank you for coming here. And, and thank you for inviting me. It's been a Welcome. great honor to come. Thank you. Welcome. Bye. Now I invite Dr. Geeta Ma'am to continue her session. Dr. Geeta. Dr. Geeta Ma'am. Yeah, yeah. Dr. Geeta, ma'am. Yeah, yeah. Uh, am I audible? Yeah, yeah. Yes, ma'am. You're audible. Thank you, ma'am. Please start your session, ma'am. Well, participants, as the second speaker was due, so I had to give a break. Now let's continue with the question number 10. Now this question number 10 is from December 2017. Well, the IR spectrum of this comple uh, complex shows bands at the values they have given. Now what you have to find out is the stretching frequency of cobalt deuterium, okay? Now, what you are going to see here is among the values, the other one are going to the carbonyl. So I'll take the 1934 centimeter inverse. Now we know already that the stretching frequency is inversely related to your reduced mass. Now I'm going to take a ratio of the reduced mass of mu COH by mu COD. That is equal to, because you know it's inversely proportional to the reduced mass. So you will have the square root of the reduced mass of cobalt deuterium in the numerator followed by reduced mass of cobalt hydrogen in the denominator. Well, we know the formula, reduced mass of COH is this. Now here, we know the mass of cobalt is very much greater than mass of hydrogen. So basically, I can omit the mass of hydrogen. So this becomes MCO by MCH by MC. Now here, you can cancel also, can you mute the other participants, please? Uh, the microphone is on. Participants, please mute your phone. microphone. Participants, 
please mute your phone. Ita, ma'am, unmute yourself, ma'am. Ita, ma'am. Yeah, I have unmuted. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Okay. Now, next you have the reduced mass of cobalt deuterium. Now, you have this expression here again. The mass of cobalt is very much greater than mass of deuterium. So, I'm going to omit this from here. So, I'll be left out with this equation where in the numerator and the denominator they are common, which I'm just going to cancel it out. Finally, I'm left with mass of deuterium. Now, if you look into the ratio of the reduced mass, this becomes equal to mass of deuterium by mass of hydrogen. We know the mass of deuterium is twice the mass of hydrogen, so that is equal to 2. So, here you know since you are supposed to find out the stretching frequency for cobalt deuterium, so this is directly equal to the square root ratio of the reduced mass. So, I have taken this here. So, reduced mass square root of cobalt deuterium divided by square root of reduced mass of cobalt hydrogen is square root of 2. Now, if I substitute in this particular equation, this becomes 1934 divided by reduced uh, stretching frequency of cobalt deuterium that is equal to square root of 2. So, this when you work it out, it comes around 1367. Fine. And you look at the values, this value is nearby. So, your correct option is option B. Next, we have question number 11 from December 2017. Here they have given, assuming the coupling constant between the phosphorus and hydrogen is greater than the coupling constant between the phosphorus and boron, the expected P30 NMR of this adduct they have given, and they have given you the I value for boron also because they know that you know the I value for proton. Even if they don't give you, you are supposed to know the I value of certain maybe proton, phosphorus, fluorine, carbon, proton, boron, and so on. Now you look into this. Now here, first we'll see phosphorus 13 NMR. Now here what happens is when we, because of hydrogen. Now this here you have three hydrogens. We know earlier itself, we have seen the splitting formula is 2 Ni plus 1. So you have 2 here, 3 is the number of hydrogen, and half is the I value for proton, plus 1 is a constant. So when you work it out, that becomes 4. That means you expect 4 lines. But when you look at the option A, you have 2 lines, and here also only 2. So I can rule out option A and B. Now I'm left with option C and D. So I have to go to the next one. So next the phosphorus NMR, if it's coupling with the boron, then two into how many boron you have? One. And what is the I value of boron? Three by two. So when you substitute and work it out again, you get four. Now when you look at the option C and four, you do have quartet of quartet, no doubt about it. This is also quartet of quartet. This is also quartet of quartet. But when you look, the first one is 1 is to 3 is to 3 is to 1. And you know the coupling constant between phosphorus and hydrogen is greater. So, okay, this is 1 is to 1, 3 is to 3 is to 1. Here also it is 1 is to 3 is to 3 is to 1. Fine. Now, the next splitting because of boron, it, uh, you know this is 1 is to 1 is to 1 is to 1. But when you look at the option D, here it is again 1 is to 3 is to 3 is to 1, so I can omit this. So my answer is option C. So for question number 11, the correct option is C. Coming to question number 12, the G factor for proton and C13 NMR, they have given the values respectively for the same value of the magnetic field strength. If the proton resonates at 600 megahertz, then carbon-13 would resonate at. Now, this is a question from December 2017, and they have given various values as well, options. Here, you should always remember, see, whenever you are want to solve a problem, think you have a solution for the problem. In that case, problem solving will not be difficult at all. You just see what are the values you can take it. Just think what formula can be used and substitute, you'll be getting up the solution. Now we'll go here. 
Here, if you see, they have given the resonance for proton. Okay. And the G factor value, which is the dimensionless uh, quantity for your gyromagnetic ratio. This is 5.6 and 1.4. This is a constant value. Anyway, you need not have to remember. They'll give you the values if they want you to solve it. So nu is equal to G B, B by 2 pi. Now here they have given the magnetic field strength is constant. So here B is constant. And your 2 pi is a constant value. So basically, your stretching, uh, sorry, here the frequency, resonating frequency is directly proportional to your G value. So now you have supposed to know the resonating frequency for carbon 13. So I can just take a ratio of proton is to carbon. So uh, nu H by nu C is equal to G H by D C. I have substituted the value of nu H, D H, C H. And when I rearrange and get it, the resonating frequency of carbon, it's ends up in 150 megahertz. It's very simple and you get four marks, isn't it? Okay, so for question number 12, the correct option is C. Gita, ma'am? Gita, ma'am? Gita, ma'am? Yeah, I think, uh, is it clear now? Uh, your uh, screen, I could screen, ma'am. Is it visible now? Now it's okay. Okay. Well, question number 13, again, uh, revamp over here. Now you, here you see the ligands, like they are not pi acceptor ligands, okay? So when they are not pi acceptor ligands, you cannot think of metal to ligand charge transfer. So outright, I can omit option C. And when you look at cadmium and mercury 2+, plus, they are in the plus two oxidation state. And when they are in plus two oxidation state, you know it has got a D10 configuration. And when you have D0 or D10 configuration, you cannot expect DD transition. So option B can be omitted. And also option D, because here also you have DD transition. So I'm just ruling out option D. I'm left with option A. That is ligand to metal charge transfer. So for question number 13, your correct option is option A. Coming to question number 14, just by looking at the problem, you can be sure it is something like uh, maybe the earlier problem we had solved for a certain magnetic field of free proton spin transition occurs at 700 megahertz. Keeping the magnetic field constant, the nitrogen 14 nucleus will resonate at, they have given you the values of GH and GN. Now same formula, you're using it. And when you want to get the resonating frequency for nitrogen, that is equal to 700 into 0.4 divided by 5.6, which works out to 50 megahertz. So your answer is option D for question number 14. Coming to question number 15, um, which is the question from December 2016. The HOMO, HOMO means the highest occupied molecular orbital to LUMO, lowest unoccupied molecular orbital, electronic transition responsible for the observed colors of halogen molecules is. So now since it's a halogen molecule, so you have, you can be very cool because we know the MO of halogens. So for that, if you see, I have given here the MOs of all the, starting from your lithium to neon, 
we know which is very specific for us to live in this world is oxygen and especially oxygen is very important in this particular period so we we'll can never uh, forget oxygen so you remember the mo diagram of oxygen now oxygen you have because when you talk about uh, 2s you will have sigma and sigma star fine when it comes to p orbitals you will have 1 or uh, 2p sigma and 2 pi orbitals similarly you will have pi star and sigma star now here the order is sigma pi pi star sigma star and from oxygen onwards this is going to be your mo okay but before oxygen you have to just remember there is a difference over here that means your pi star comes sorry pi comes below and the energy of sigma is higher than that of pi that's all everything is same so now we'll go back now you have seen the mo of halogens is similar to that of oxygen and here if you see this is the highest occupied molecular orbital and this is your lowest occupied molecular orbital fine now coming to this you can see here this is sigma this is pi this is pi star well this is the homo and this is lumo so you will expect the transition from your pi star to sigma star now you look at the options so the option is a is correct so for question number 15 the correct option is a next we have question number 16 from december 2016 proton nma spectrum of an organic compound recorded on a 500 megahertz spectrometer showed a quartet with line splitting positions they have given you four values because of the quartets okay the chemical shift del and coupling constant of the quartet <laughs> they have given you the values the chemical shift as well as the coupling constant now we'll go one by one now here what you have to do is they have given the values of all the quartets that's the delta value i'm not the delta value it is the hertz in hertz they have given now here since this one is going to be an average of this so first you have to calculate the average line position that works out to be you add up all and then divide it by 4 because it's a quartet you end up with 1750 now we know that del value is calculated by taking delta nu that is from the tms the shift divided by the nu of the spectrophotometer that means spectrometer like whatever is the frequency and since it is given in megahertz so i'm going to use this formula so directly you what you do is 1750 divided by 500 you end up with 3.5 ppm now you look into the option find a has it b has it but when you look at the option c you don't have it is 3.6 and option d also it is 3.6 so i can omit option c and d finally i'm left with option a and b now here the coupling constant now what is a coupling constant coupling constant is nothing but the distance between your two multiplets whatever and it's going to be the same whether you take the difference between this and this or this and this or this and this so you can just get a difference between the subsequent lines the splits so here you get 6 hertz so now you look into the option find option b is wrong and you are left with only option a which is correct so for question number 16 your the correct option is a Now coming to question number seventeen, the spectroscopic ground state term symbols for the octahedral aqua complex of manganese two, chromium three, and cobalt two respectively are. Now here, if you see, first thing is you are supposed to know that how to arrive at the ground state term symbol. Now the ground state term symbol here it is two s plus one, that is a spin multiplicity, and this l is the the cumulative l value and j is a coupling constant now we'll see one by one manganese 2 manganese 2 we know it belongs to d5 system and since it's an aqua ligand which is a weak field ligand and octahedral splitting is going to be t2g eg and here they are not going to get paired up so you have 1 1 1 so totally you have five electrons being filled up Now, when you want to calculate L value, this is plus two, plus one, zero, minus one, minus two. So everything together works out to be zero when you add everything. So your L value is zero. 
and S is for five unpaired electrons, each will have half contribution. So your S is five by two. So when you calculate the spin multiplicity to S plus one, it works out to be six. Fine, now how you're going to write it? Six and L, if it is zero, we know it is S. So it is sextet of S, sextet S. Next, when you consider chromium three, we know Chromium 2, we all know it is D4 system. So always you have to be very careful when the oxidation state, generally we remember it as chromium 2 only, but here it is chromium 3, it is D3 state. So again, here, if you calculate the L value, plus 2, plus 1, 0. So totally when it works out, it is 3. You have 3 unpaired electrons, so S is equal to 3 by 2. And you just add, calculate the spin multiplicity, it works out to be 4. Well, your L value is three. So you look here, so it means F. So your ground state term symbol is quartet of F. Fine, I was just going on calculating. Anyway, if you see for manganese, when you calculated, it was sextet of S. Now you look into the option. Yeah, I can omit option A. I can also omit option C. I'm left with option B and option D. And both of them, of course, they do have sextet of S and triple. Uh, quartet F. Now we are left with co copper 2 plus. It belongs to D9 system. And here, this is the electrons, how they are arranged. So when you calculate the L value, the first upspin, everything gets cancelled. The downspin, if you see, only this my uh, plus 1, everything is, gets cancelled. You are left with only 2. So your L value is 2. Fine. So L value is two means it is D. That is what you have here is D. And how many unpaired electrons you have? One unpaired electrons. So when you calculate the spin multiplicity, it is two into half plus one. So that is equal to two. So it is doublet of D. So now you look into the options B and D, fine. Option B is the wrong option, so I'm omitting it. And your correct option is option B. So for question number 17, option B is the correct answer. Next, we have question number 18. For complex A, deterioration of NH protons does not alter the EPR spectrum. The number of hyperfine lines expected in the EPR spectrum of A is given. They have given you the I value of copper also. So now when you see copper, it belongs to here. What is the oxidation state of copper? Because you have the complex overall is neutral, but you have two minus, so your copper, copper has the oxidation state of plus two. And we know it belongs to D9 system with one unpaired electron, fine. So it is going to be EPR active. Now first, it will be split by the copper. Next, it will be, I think someone is annotating it. Can you just? Yes, ma'am, we'll do that, Wait, just, just a minute. Yeah, I have cleared it. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. So now here I have uh, copper. Okay, fine. This will be split into for copper. It is uh, I is equal to fine. now when I, it's going to be split. It is going to be 2Ni of copper plus 1, where I value of copper is 3 by 2. They have given you substitute here. And then with nitrogen, how many nitrogen you have? 2 nitrogen. And what is the I value of nitrogen? We know it is 1, so you are just substituting it. Next, you may ask, why not this hydrogen? But if you remember in the question, they say the deterioration of NH proton does not alter the EPR spectrum. That means your hydrogen is not involved in the coupling. So we are just left with coupling with copper and nitrogen that works out to be 20. So your correct option is option A. Next, we have question number 19. The reaction between Pi3, PaCl3 and zinc powder gives P3I3 as one of the product. The solution state of phosphorus 31 NMR spectrum of P3N3, oh, sorry, I3 shows doublet and triplet, the correct structure of P3I3 are. They have given you four probable structures you have to see. Now, as we know, for NM, any kind of NMR, the number of signals is going to be equal to the unique 
kinds of that particular species, whether it's proton or phosphorus or fluorine, it's immaterial. Now, if I look here, this, I can say it belongs to one kind of proton. Let me call it as A. This is different because the environment is different. So this is B. And here again, it's different. So for this, I'll expect three signals. But here you get only two signals for P, 3, I, 5. So I can omit option A. Now coming to option B here, I have, let me call it as A. This is different. Well, this is PI, but here you have a double bond. So this is entirely a different phosphorus. So here again, I have, I'll have i get three signals. So again, I can omit B. Now coming to D, yeah, this is different. This is only phosphorus, whereas, sorry, this is, so it's going to be different B. And this phosphorus has three iodine, so it is C. So here again, I'll expect three signals, so I can cancel it out B. So I'll be left with option C. Now let's see. Here, if I call it as uh, the first one with the one iodine as A, the two iodine as B, and here again, I have the same as B. So I'll expect only two types. So your correct answer is going to be option C. And when you look into the splitting, this one will be split by two phosphorus into triplet. And these two phosphorus will give you a signal which will be split up by this one phosphorus, which one will be a double. So the correct option for your question number 19 is C. Coming to question number 20, which is from June 2016. Now here they have given you a nickel complex and shows an absorption bands. They have given you the values. Whereas another nickel complex at, they have given you the values. So now there are asking L and L dash are respectively. Now, when you look at these two complexes, both of them are nickel complexes and both of them have same oxidation state. Only difference is your ligand. And we know the splitting here, what one you see in the first case, when your ligand is L, you have small value separation. Whereas when you have L dash, the separation is higher. And you know, when you have small delta naught, that means small, uh, I mean, just the splitting, then you, th we have weak field ligands. When the splitting is large, then we have strong field ligands. Now, so that you are supposed to know the spectrochemical series, there is no other go. But when you see here, this nitrogen, uh, ammonia, and above, you have strong field, and below this, you have weak field. Now, you look at the option A, OH minus, and N3 minus, you have it in the weak field ligand. There. So I can just cross it because one has to be weak field, the other one has to be strong field. Now, here again, Cl minus and I minus. See, Cl minus and I minus is even weaker than Cl minus. That's why. And NCS, here you have, and carboxylate, like oxalate, you can compare that is even weaker than NCS. So that's the reason why we are just omitting A, B, and C. But when you look option D, you have water before and NH3 after. So your correct option is option D. So for question number 20, your correct option is D. Fine. So the next question is the number of lines shown by BH3 part of the molecule, this adduct in the proton and B11, boron 11 NMR spectra are respectively. See here, they have given you the I value for boron as well as I value of phosphorus. Even if they don't give you, you have to just remember four or five values. And see, almost all are uh, half, except nitrogen one, boron three by two, and so on. Fine. Now, when it comes to here, like first, they have asked to calculate the proton. Now, for proton, you know, proton will couple with boron. Now, here, if you see, the proton NMR, it has got one boron. And so I'm going to substitute two into one. And what is the I value of boron? It is three by two. So two into one into three by two plus one. So that works out as four quarter. Next, your boron will, uh, I mean, so the proton will also be split by the phosphorus. Now you look here, it is two Ni plus one. So how many phosphorus you have? One, you know, the I value of phosphorus is half. So totally it works out to be two. So four into two, your answer is eight. So first 
when it is mean in the proton nmr you are expected to have eight splitting lines now you look at the options eight okay so i can just keep it in abeyance because we have to look into the other option also but when i look into the option b fine here you have four so i can cross it option c has three again i can omit this option, uh, option d has six again i can omit it so i'm just left with option a but anyway i have to cross check it before taking it now coming to the boron nmr it is going to be split by these three protons so number of nucleus three the spin is half so that works out to be four now with phosphorus how many phosphorus one so two into one into half plus one that is two so totally this also four into two eight of course in the option a you have eight and eight so that is the correct answer for question number 21 that's the correct option i think we have come to the end of this uh discussion now i was asked to deal with the spectroscopic problems now last week only in a workshop i had given uh, organic spectroscopic problems csr so I didn't want to because the audience may be almost may half of the audience may be the earlier audience also. So I had just omitted the organic part here specifically. So that is why I have covered physical and inorganic. Those who are interested to know about the organic spectroscopic problems, I have given the link here. I'll also post it in the chat box. Those who are interested, you can look into it. And if any questions, please, you can ask. Any questions from the participants? Any questions from the participants? Post it in your chat box. Any questions from the participants? So in the absence of any questions, I take this opportunity to thank Dr. Geeta Ma'am. Geeta ma'am, thank you so much. You have been very, very, the session was really brainstorming, interactive. And I think the participants cannot ask more than this. And you have been very accommodative. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you for all that. I think spectroscopy cannot be made more easy than this one. So anybody will start loving spectroscopy after your uh, lecture. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you so much. Thank you, ma'am, for the opportunity. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, Geeta ma'am. Thank you. Now I invite Ms. Gayatri to propose the vote of thanks. Am I heard you, ma'am? Yeah, yes, you can start. Yes. Okay. Thanks is not a word. It is an expression of gratitude, happiness, and affection. I thank the Almighty for giving, showering his blessing to make this function a success. My sincere thanks to the Member Secretary, Dr. R. Srinivasan, Tamil Nadu State Council for Science and Technology for accepting with us in their workshop. We also thank him for his presentation. He was very accommodative and extended his full cooperation for the conference as well as for this workshop. I, I take this opportunity to thank Dr. Dillon, University of Leicester, UK for accepting our invitation and presenting himself for this workshop. Dylan, my humble thanks to Dr. Geeta, Associate Professor and Head, Department of Chemistry, Muthirangam Government Arts College, Velo, for making this workshop very lively and interactive. Motivation is the mother of innovation. No one can match our principal in motivating a staff and student. Thank you, ma'am, for your constant support and encouragement. I am in short of words to thank our head of our department, who has been a pillar of support in all our endeavors. I thank department staff members for their cooperation. I thank our participants for their overwhelming participation. Thank you, one and all. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, participants, now we shared the feedback link in the chat box. And Geeta ma'am also shared the organic spectroscopic problems in the, share box, uh, in the chat box. I think we can, uh, with this, we can wind up the session. Uh, HOD ma'am? Yes, ma'am. Uh, Nitya? Shidem, yeah, yeah. Shidem, ma'am, you can. Invi invitation. Yeah, invitation. Then you can uh, tell them. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, dear participants, there is one more seminar organized by the Department of Chemistry on 26th June at around 11 a.m. 
you will see the invitation in a few minutes on your screen பரதலை முடிச்சிட்டாங்களே ரெண்டு மூணு நாலு மூணு மணி நேரமா ரெண்டு மூன்று ஒன்று ரெண்டு மூன்று ஸ்ரீ மேம் எஸ் மேம் ஆ யூ ப்ளீஸ் டிஸ்ப்ளே தட் இன்விடேஷன் எஸ் மேம் எஸ் மேம் ஷீ இஸ் டூயிங் இட் மேம் நித்ய Yes, Shima. It's not at visible. Yes, Dave. No. Chodi ma'am, can you see the invitation? No, no. No, Nithya ma'am, no. Uh, yes, ah yes sir it's come yes, yes, yes so this is a national level workshop on coping strategies to overcome covid-19 stress it's on 26th june between 11 am and 12 noon by dr sujatha she is a senior resident department of psychiatry stanley medical college chennai on behalf of the department of chemistry we invite everyone for this workshop and get benefited and motivated by this program uh, ma'am can we conclude sorry ma'am yes, yes yes we can conclude ma'am and a small correction this is not the national level it's a state level workshop mm. okay ma'am yeah nitya can we conclude yeah okay on behalf of the department add the feedback link please yeah please, yeah, please uh, check the feedback link and uh, submit uh, your feedback form uh, on behalf of the department of chemistry we thank all the speakers principal hod ma'am and all the participants for taking part in this program so uh, the certificates as you all know there will be only 100 certificates dispatched per day so it will take some time so if you don't receive your certificate or if you can't access your feedback feedback form today please try the next day because once a 100 entries are over the feedback form will not take any uh, uh, in uh, intake so therefore please wait uh for for you to get your certificate at least it will take another one week or 10 days for all of you to receive your certificates so till then you please wait and get your certificates all of you will get your certificates once you fill back fill your feedback form and one more thing when you fill the feedback form please write your name type your name as well as your college correctly because once you do it wrongly we cannot do anything on that so whatever you type whatever you enter there will be reflected in the certificate so there is nothing that we can do in correction of the certificates so please when you type type your name and college properly thank you participants